Okay, so I'm going to start with setting context. I was reading just now that there's $222 billion spent in the U.S. alone, according to Statistica, on this kind of infrastructure. And I see all kinds of buzzwords like digital inclusion and digital transformation and all. And I get really confused. Could you help contextualize where we are today before we can get into the future so we know where we're starting from? Jay, I'm going to start with you. Thanks, Asha. Yeah, you know, um, there, there are a lot of buzzwords, aren't there? It can get uh, a bit overwhelming. Um, I, you know, from you know, where I sit in um, my set of responsibilities that you described, as well as um, being in a technology company, um, we're one of the top cloud providers. Uh, cloud is one of the big, um, actually, you know, names that, that's used quite heavily, but it is one of the largest, if not the largest, um, accelerators from a technology standpoint to enable businesses of all different types of industries, whether it's in pharmaceuticals, whether you're in technology, whether you're in um, various different industries, such as manufacturing, oil and gas. We're seeing that Cloud is helping enable all of these industries be able to innovate and be able to create outcomes, revenue streams, help solve really complicated and complex problems for their business and their industries, leveraging the cloud. And so from what I'm where I stand in 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 my role, I get to do a lot of that for Oracle. Um, and then I also help a lot of our customers and peers who are using our cloud to be able to explain to them the things that we're doing. So one of the big things I'd say going through kind of where we are is um, from a digital innovation and digital transformation standpoint, I think everyone is going through some form of transformation in every industry. But where I see cloud helping quite a bit is it either helps companies and industries and businesses leapfrog into being able to do something that would have taken them many years to be able to do in leveraging the type of technology that's now available easily and at a, a cost that can be managed. Um, so I see that that's really, really um, a disruptive technology and extremely innovative to help, again, um, democratizing various different industries to be able to get into different spaces by leveraging cloud technology. Thank you, Jay, that makes sense. I remember, IT used to take forever to add anything 15 years ago, and now things just get out and pop. Something new is there. Ron, if you um, agree, disagree, and also since you have such a public policy background, add your insights with that perspective too. Absolutely. And again, I just want to thank you, Asha, Jay, and Penelope. I work with all these organizations, and to be on the screen with y'all is just completely humbling for me. And I know both of these pure ladies of mine, and you do amazing work. Um, so everything Jay said is spot on. And, and what cloud has allowed companies to do, like like Jay said, leapfrog, but the cost of entry has gone to pretty much nil. It's just easier to get into the marketplace. So that's the first thing I'll quickly say. And the second thing is um, what's happening right now, digital is a buzzword, like we said earlier, but it's everything net new, like a bot. You know, think about it. A bot 20 years ago is a macro on an AS100 app. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm dating myself a little bit. I guess for hundreds of old systems. And, you know, oh, and so the ladies laughed about that because you know what I'm talking about. But essentially, it's just putting lipstick on something that's already been there before, right? It's, it's changing it up. And so I think where we're at in the industry right now, we're, technologies are all advancing at different levels. But where we unlock digital is where we find opportunities for them to kind of cross-connect and how they kind of intersect. So data is something we always had. Of course, we're going to talk a little bit later probably about chat, chat GPT. But data was always the core of that. Good data, good outcomes, AI, right? So those are the things that we need to really focus on. And when you made the statement about public policy, I served for almost two years for Governor Pritzker here in Illinois as the CIO for the state. And uh, I st stepped away from corporate America to do that because I wanted to work on STEM programs. I was really passionate about how do we get to kind of the corners of our, of our, our youth, to get them excited about STEM, STEAM, and all that, and really getting the digital divide to really close itself. And I think the pandemic really exposed the have and have nots. And so I think in short, where we're at right now is just all these different technologies are converging and how do we monetize those? How do we kind of leverage those? How do we optimize those is really, really key. And I'll pause right there because there's things I know that Penelope is doing that I've reached out to Accenture to help me with. So Penelope, I'll pass the baton to you. I assume Asha will do the same. Thank you, Ron. And Penelope, um, love, uh, would like to hear with you. And if you can also expand on your unique role, because Accenture, you have a lot of clients too, right? So how you help them today before we go into the future? Well, 
you know, Ron hit it dead on the nose. When I talk to other CIO groups, it's interesting just to reflect where we were in 2017, 2018. We were still arguing with boards about whether or not cloud was a capability that was here to stay and that everybody needed to adopt. And fast forward three or four very short years, and we are in a completely different realm of technology revolution. Not only has cloud been embraced, but it's been the platform from which all new technology has sprung. And the rate of technology change is growing faster and faster by the month, right? And so what we're seeing for companies around the world is the need to change or die, the need to reinvent themselves, to capitalize on all that marvelous technology that's enabled as soon as they move to the cloud and to use those technologies to drive their businesses in completely different directions. Accenture, just as an example, double digit growth and has added two net new business lines to our overall corporate structure just in the last five years through our ability to leverage a digital footprint. So I think this is at the top of everybody's mind right now from the most senior person on the board to the most junior person in IT and to every person in the business. And as we explore it today, what I really wanna kind of focus on is how do we give some practical advice for people to make these things real? Cause it's really fun to get on these calls and talk about the metaverse and Gen AI and 50 other buzzwords. But at the end of the day, if you can't take it and do something with it that fundamentally impacts your company, then it's just an interesting conversation. You have it today and you forget about it tomorrow. Well, thank you. Change or die. Powerful. I like that. But change into what? So I think my next question is going to, where do we go from here? And I'm going to go in the reverse order. And it's very confusing if I'm starting out now. Should I even go into the IT sector? Do I talk to the CTO? Do I talk to the CIO? I mean, the things are converging so much, right? And with that in mind, could you, uh, Penelope, I'll start with you. Could you expand on where Accenture is going and also me? If our, to our audience, what we should be thinking if we are newly graduating or whether we have been in the workplace for a few years or more? Well, certainly right now, if you're graduating and entering the workforce, there has never been a better time to get your hands in tech. But the great thing about living in today, which I think uh, all of my peers on the panel would agree with me on, is that you don't have to be in IT to live in tech. We have been able to democratize a lot of these technologies through the cloud and through the use of distributed data to power up businesses to actually do and develop their own technology. Low code, no code, pick your poison, right? But at the end of the day, what's happening is because we've been able to lift all these capabilities on the cloud platforms, distribute their data around the world, and then apply this layer of newer technology on top of it that allows for better collaboration and accessibility, almost anyone can work with systems just like an IT engineer used to do in, in days of yore. And we at Accenture see that as the future. Whether you do that through the metaverse as your tool or whether you do it through a collaboration platform or whether you do it through business collaboration and training, it really doesn't matter. What's important is working hip to hip across an entire company, cross functionally to figure out how to lift the company performance by applying technology in the right places. Does that help? It does. So in the future, if you have to tell us and paint the picture, it's basically since it's democratized, we can just use this in whatever field we're doing. Did I characterize that correctly? Yes, partially. And partially because data is an enabler that gives everyone an equal footing and access to understand what good performance looks like, where you are as a company and what good performance looks like. So for the first time, we're able through technology to give everybody in the company a common view and common goalposts about how to drive performance. It's been kind of a holy grail for us for a long time, and we're really excited to see it come to life today. Makes sense. Data is power, right? Because with that, you can do a lot. So Ron, how about you? Do you want to expand on this, please? With yeah. Um, so I, I'm only going to say, and, 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 well, Penel Penelope says, I'm not the type to say what she said in different words. She said it perfectly. Um, but to, to answer your question, you asked a specific question. What would I tell someone coming to the workforce? So I have that example. My son's graduating DePaul University next month. And 
I encourage this kid, my son, to, you know, math, <laughs> sorry, math and data science. That's where you should go. That's what, you know, he, and, I, and he's like, well, why? Everyone could do math. Like, it's not about the math, Jordan. His name is Jordan. I'm from Chicago. Makes sense. Um, you have to be a problem solver. I want you to be a problem solver. And if you're really good at mathematics, you see things out of the box. You see things, inputs, data points that are just different. You visualize things in a different way. So um, he is graduating in a, with a math sciences and, and data um, degree, which is great. But the second thing and to, to your audience as well, the ability to communicate and be a storyteller. I think that is so important these days. There's so many people that I've surrounded myself that are just absolutely rocket science. They, they get it. But at the end of the day, you have to be able to articulate what that is, really, and really tell a story about what is the problem statement. I see a problem, and here is how I've broken it down, and here's a solution. And the third part of that is just collaboration. You have to be able to like Penelope said, bring in everyone into the room. And I always have a lot of Hamilton references. I'll try to kind of keep them down, but bring everyone in the room, have a conversation and be that problem solver that everyone wants on their team. That is such a huge deal nowadays, right? Because nowadays with agile and how we're doing project management, not everyone is ticked and tied into one discipline on a project. Everyone has to have transferable skills and pull out your utility belt. So for, again, for Jordan, what I always tell him is problem solve, um, communicate and be able to be a storyteller. And then the collaboration is so important. The technology is going to be there. The technology is going to evolve. But if you have those key tenants, I think you'll be you know, doing a wonderful thing. And if someone told me that 25 years ago when I got into the IT game, I would have been thanking them because, you know, I had to learn that on the job. Thank you, Ron. And Jay, um, your thoughts and also how do you keep the developers excited in all the different fields? Yeah. Um, so again, plus plus to what Penelope and Ron said. And by the way, I'm a big Jordan fan and we all fought for the number 23 because that was like the thing to, you know, go after in sports and, uh, but, uh, well, good. Um, so, so yeah, yeah, Asha, I, I love all, all the great things that my colleagues, um, said and, you know, where, um, I'd like to add a little bit of nuance is when, um, we were going through our transformation and we're still going, everyone's going through something, right. As I mentioned, but, uh, one of the things is there are some existing skill sets that also need to be transferable. So it's also for the new incoming, but for those who are part of, you know, some technology that they're working on 10 years ago and things have evolved and there's new technology, there's new tools, there's new things that have evolved. The embrace change part is definitely the theme, but it's also providing the proper levels of training and education to help, you know, continue to grow and develop because the key uh, skills that Ron is talking about, those are very important to have no matter what happens, right? Technology will constantly change, things will constantly change, but having those core tenants, I think is also amazing and important. But then it's also knowing that technology will change and evolve. Penelope talked about how before, you know, we didn't, people didn't even think about cloud, you know, even five years back, they weren't thinking about putting their critical workloads onto such a thing. And now it's about not a matter of, you know, should I, it's a matter of when and how am I going to do it and how quickly can I get it on and um, move on. So I think that that's um, a big part of what's kind of shifting what we see. And then on the thing about the developers and, you know, one of the big things we do is because we are a big technology company, we have a huge development arm is we also listen to the voice of the developers, right? We get feedback, we do kind of a feedback loop. So we know kind of what are the important things? What are things that you're struggling with? What are the challenges? And from that, we identify that there are some gaps in things, or we have people working in silos. How do we connect those and integrate that? And how do we create a better developer experience and community so that we can also make it better for our own developers, but then also for our customers who are also um, big time developers using our products um, and services. Thank you. I was thinking, I'm dating myself now, but Y2K was such a big deal. <laughs> and now we do things that are much more transformative on a daily basis, if not monthly. So I'm going to jump over to an audience question uh, to break it up. And I'm going to start with you, Ron. How can organizations measure the ROI and business value of their cloud investments? So again, how do you measure it? And what metrics should they use to evaluate their success? That's a great question. There's several, several different ways. And, and, and Jay, this is definitely your wheelhouse, so I'm not going to take your thunder. Um, but what I will say is, uh, first, I would always say start with your baseline. Knowing where you're starting from is super important. Um, everyone, as Jay and Penelope said, are going through transformations. Every company has a transformation officer for a reason. But actually, when you think about it, we're all transformation officers. And we should think in that manner. 
Um, I worked for Toyota for almost 20 years and um, Kaizen is something that's always been top of mind for me. Like continuous improvement is so important. The first measure though, for what I would say is optimizing, you know, just to spend on infrastructure. And the thing that you have to keep in mind, I think everyone in your audience will know this, when you go to the cloud, you're going to a little bit more of a subscription. It's not more capital spend. Um, so you got to start thinking about that every year you have to put money aside for this level of, of cloud adoption and cloud usage. Just keep that in mind. You can't say, well, this year I'm just going to skip it. You can't do that. Um, so just keep that in mind. I've had some very interesting debates in my past life, um, past past life on this topic. The second thing I'd always do is really measure vulnerabilities. I always want to have a cyber lens in everything I do. Not everything is applicable to the cloud, even though we think we just move it mm -hmm. all to the cloud. Really understand the vulnerability of moving to the cloud uh, and the threat vectors that you have with that. When I worked for the state of Illinois, we had foreign nations attack our voter polls, for example, and that was something that was held accountable by Governor Pritzker, uh, reducing that threat vector. And the third one is just total cost of ownership. I think that's something you just have to really think about. Um, where you used to have an outsourced provider providing you your data center support, what have you, um, you bring that into you having your cloud engineers, people who understand the nuances of spinning up a server or an instance, if you will. So I think those are the things that you have to think about when you kind of really think of the broad scale of KPIs for, for the cloud. But again, I, I defer to Jay, this is definitely something that's in our wheelhouse. Yeah. And Jay, as you expand, on the answer. Yeah. Also, I know you've done some mission critical work, right? And Ron mentioned not everything should be transferred. So how should we be thinking about these metrics, including like trade secrets yeah. or sensitivity and all? Yeah, and I think a big part of it is really um, total cost of ownership, right? So measuring all the things, like what are the things that you're actually measuring um, and, and tracking? And um, maybe some companies, could have been even the one I worked for, thought that infrastructure was free initially. And then when they started putting their workloads on the cloud, they're like, wait a minute, why is this so much? Why is this costing me so much? How, what, what? And then, but it it, it drove the transparency and the, the right behaviors, which was really understand, you know, what um, your applications, your workloads are doing, how they're doing it. And frankly, a lot of where we gained um, the efficiencies and benefits of going to the cloud and a lot of the stories we share with um, our peer CIOs is that when we had our workloads and um, our infrastructure built on premises, and then we transferred those and migrated those and deprecated a bunch, but migrated those onto the cloud, there was actual waste. The utilization of what we were allocating for our workloads was a mismatch. So we over allocated more infrastructure to the actual utilization of that workload. So once you start to really look at the data and be more transparent about like how you're spending it, what you're using, how you're using it, you're then able to make better decisions and um, actually optimize your workload. So that's a big part of where the benefit comes from as well. But looking at the total cost of ownership, everything from who's supporting it, how many are supporting it, what are the tools you use? And then Ron brings out a point, you know, such as uh, cybersecurity and some, some of the security concerns. And that's that's actually been, um, you know, not to promote our product, but that's actually been a big part of where we, why we differentiate ourselves in the market from a cloud perspective is because of the concerns of cloud. And frankly, in public cloud, the adoption is still relatively low. It's like 30 something percent. So there is the 70% that we talk about this cloud and it's majorly transformational, but still people aren't using it. And a big part of why they're not is because of those concerns that Ron described some data privacy, residency of the data, control, access, and those important factors. And there are things that cloud can do to help um, enable the, those concerns um, to be able to put workloads that have not been able to take the benefits and get all the benefits of cloud. And so these are things that we've been actually maniacally working on because of the fact that historically, customers that use our products are running very sensitive, critical data, mission critical workloads, we're talking about, you know, fields of like healthcare and where lives frankly matter really um, with, with the amount of information, the data and how they're using the cloud. So it's really an important thing, Asha, that, you know, really it, it's like making sure you have the right levels of security, the right levels of privacy, the right levels of, of course, performance, um, as well as of course, cost and ROIs and all those important things that matter. Thank you, Jay. And Penelope, do you want to add, especially given the role Accenture plays in enabling so many of these corporations? I would just ask people to think differently about this. If you're having a conversation about the ROI on moving to the cloud, you've missed the point. Mm -hmm. The cloud is like a computer. It's like the internet. It's a foundational capability upon which everything that is to come rides. 
And it's necessary for you to be able to jump off the cliff and embrace the new wave of technology that's coming. Can anybody think about trying to run algorithmic models on data distributed in 47 separate locations in separated infrastructure? I can't, right? So some of the things we want to do to serve our company simply aren't possible if we don't take a strong cloud position. So I always encourage other CIOs who are struggling with their board and investment chains when it comes to base cloud consumptive capabilities, getting your position loaded in the cloud, that's not an ROI conversation. That's a do or die conversation. Then you can have an ROI conversation about what to do when you live in the cloud and things have relative value, but not the position itself, or at least I don't believe so. Can I, interject, can I interject one thing real quick? It's just through experience. Oftentimes we say we move everything to the cloud, but then we still have some key components that are on-prem. And then something happens and you realize, wait, this should not go down. Oh, I didn't realize that it connected back to something that was on-prem, a key data element for something. So your topology, your architecture, you really have to understand the architecture of your systems. I, I just want to interject that because there's so many times that, okay, well, the data's went down, but those are all cloud-based um, applications. Are they? I mean, mm -hmm. Are they truly 100% on the cloud? The answer most likely is no. Really understand the topology of your architecture. Makes sense. You know, this reminds me in the wireless world of not that long ago, six months from now, mm -hmm. push to talk is coming. Six months from now, and thanks to the cloud and think differently, oh, it can come in an hour from now, right? And new features. I'd like to say all of this is very, very good. But then what about sustainability and not greenwashing it, for example, right? I was reading all these large numbers, like if you look at, um, you know, uh, uh, Innovate or things like that, um, there are things people claim 1% of the world's electricity is data centers. Uh, but I do know there's a lot of innovation. So how do you make this a business imperative and a win-win-win for the stakeholders, the customers and all? So I'll start with you, Penelope. Sure, and and going back to the cloud, and we'll keep coming back there throughout this entire conversation, the first best and most positive step that a CIO can take for their company's carbon footprint position is to get off-prem. Because when you move your capabilities to the cloud, you spread the cost of consumption across a much wider, much more effective and efficient base than your own. So for a first time jump in carbon footprint reduction, there's no better thing than moving to the cloud. Once you get there, then finding incremental progress when we're talking about IT work and how it eats carbon, um, finding incremental progress can be a little difficult. You have to do a couple of key things that I'm sure my peers would agree with. One is think of it as shifting left in the development process. You have to think about sustainability just like you think about security and just like you think about experience as part of the design. You don't figure it out and build it and then figure out how to make it sustainable. That way lies madness, right? And the cost of trying to do that for the benefit you reap from it is very small. What you need to do is to back up your development life cycle, right? And to make sure that during the design phase, sustainability and consumptive behavior patterns of the application, whether it's where it resides or how it uses data, are factored into your actual design. The second thing you have to do is you have to make sustainability a common language among your team. Mm -hmm. People do what they're incented to do. And if you put a carbon footprint monitor on everybody's screen that says, hey, you want to go to that conference in X and such? Take a plane there. You're going to eat this much carbon footprint and you're going to have to find a way to put that back in the environment. So how many trees are you going to plant? Right. It's not about what the actual actions are. It's about the awareness of what the individual impact is through their development of software, through their travel, through their consumption or procurement on behalf of the company and making sure that that is always front and center in their decision making because they have access to the data. So those are the couple of things that I think about. What about my peers? Jay, you want to continue? Yeah. 
Definitely, Penelope. And I and I agree with you. It, you know, we have an official title of a chief sustainability officer, but it's not just his role to go and be responsible for sustainability of, um, you know, Oracle or what it represents. And um, it is should be a core, you know, competency of the company. And, uh, you know, we have responsibilities as well because we are offering cloud and cloud regions. We're very conscientious about our footprint. And one of the things as part of the total cost of ownership and that ROI piece, Asha, to kind of take it back, is that that's one of the big benefits we got of actually getting off of some of the on-premises and onto um, our cloud platforms and how we got much more efficient in our carbon footprint. And um, we now offer the ability to kind of track and be able to measure some of that. So it gives better, again, transparency in how do you measure your um, carbon footprint. We also have taken on some uh, aggressive goals um, specifically in, in this area uh, because, you know, as one of the um, top cloud providers, uh, we have a lot of data centers and footprints around the world. And so um, we took on um, a, a goal in 2025 of achieving 100 percent renewable energy. Um, we also have gone even you know, more ambitious to say, hey, we're going to be carbon neutral um, by 2050. So there's you know, some some really um, aggressive things that we're doing because we know it's you know it's it's the right thing to do and again it's it's one of the key importances of not just for you know oracle but it's important for our customers it's important for our partners it's important for actually even when we um, are looking to acquire talent a lot of times they do ask us about what our sustainability goals are what are our esg um, commitments and so this is actually a big thing that um, even potential candidates and employees are are looking at how responsible we are being as a company beyond just the financial viability of the company you. And Ron, anything to add, uh, especially from the public sector side? Uh, absolutely. And I'm going to say what she said and what she said. So I'll start off with that. Um, from the public sector side, I think the one thing, you know, so as you know, I, I, I left HP recently and, you know, I'm looking for me, something happened when I worked in the public sector. When I worked for Governor Pritzker, I worked for my home state. It, it just kind of just ignited something in me where I really want to find that apex of where academia business and government comes together. There's this Venn diagram and there's this person in the middle, right? And what are we all doing to improve um, this planet we live on? And there's something there that we could all do. So everything the, the lady said is spot on. But the thing I'll say is just um, beyond the cloud, the devices that we use, they're so disposable mm -hmm. now. Let's find, let's work together as a community and find ways to kind of reinvest those, you know, move those to other, areas of less fortunate areas. My parents are from Haiti, um, for example. And you know, the thing about HP that I love is that a lot of the um, ink cartridges and the laptops, the plastics are made from recycled materials that are ocean bound from the, the, the beaches of Haiti and other areas. And, and those are the things that we need to kind of really be proud of and move things forward. Um, but how we also just make things sustainable from the device, the, the consumer electronics part is super important. And when it comes to public sector, this is where great companies such as um, Oracle and Accenture could help. Um, I'm learning from the time I was working in government that the influence, the lobbying, the, hey, these are some of the rules we need to change. Um, the lean from big companies such as the ones that are on this call will help kind of change the hearts and minds because at the end of the day, that's what's gonna change the legislation on certain things. So I think that's where I think all the companies could be you know, great corporate citizens. I think they're all pretty good already put a lean on on our government sector and say, hey, demand better from us. And so we could do better. I think that's super important. I'll give one quick example. During COVID, we were having issues, of course, and the digital divide is not just an urban issue. It's a rural issue, right? And Illinois, as you know, is a heavy agricultural state. And we realized that some kids did not have Wi-Fi. So we worked with the public schools and my alum, University of Illinois, and we parked um, bookmobiles in certain areas and distributed free Wi-Fi overnight so kids could do their homework. Little things like that so we can kind of close that digital divide. That's where we need corporations to make the donations. And it's not just donations of a device, in time and effort. A lot of your engineers, I know Jay and Penelope, probably do this anyway. They go to a local school and they help out redo a computer lab. Those are where we kind of really need to start moving them out and some things. And that's where I get really excited because there's so much opportunity there that we haven't really tapped into yet. So a lot of BKMs, public-private partnerships. Absolutely. We have. We have about eight minutes left, so I'm going to try to get a couple of questions in. As you think of our audience, right, Ron, I'll start with you since you mentioned transferable skills. What are and um, what are some of the transferable skills that we all need to be in this brave new world as we emerge into the future? 
Okay, so I'll double click on some of the, uh, a little, I'll be brief on this because I can't on this one for a while. The problem solving one is a big one. I, I just seeing a problem, and Enrique Laura's the CEO, um, said this best. We did a town hall with him, and he, he said it so eloquently. He started as, a, as an intern engineer at HP, he's now the CEO. So he's made the move, right? Um, fall in love with a problem. Like, fall in love and see a problem. I'm going to be one to help fix that problem. That Rubik's Cube I'm going to solve. So really be passionate about that problem that's in front of you, right? The second thing I'll say, um, which is very important, and like I said a little bit earlier, is how do you kind of tell a compelling narrative? You don't have to watch Shark Tank and stare at people doing it. Like, there's ways to, but just really explain to people in the room why we're trying to do this, right? And be inclusive on that. That's the collaboration part. You know, inclusive, I know, is also sometimes, unfortunately, a buzzword. The things I do, whether I'm a board member or in C-suite or, or what have you, is I always ask people in the room who are relatively quiet, what are your thoughts, right? Janice, what are your thoughts? Jerome, what are your thoughts? Bring them into the room, right? Everyone has a voice and you know they should be able to kind of bring it out. But I think that's a transferable skill, the ability to collaborate and bring people together. And then they'll want you on your team. So I think those are the things for me have served me well through the years. Because my first job at Toyota wasn't in IT. Pre-Y2K, I was a repo agent. <laughs> I was looking for cars in Chicago, right? I had to learn. Uh, there's so, some stories there. Over there's here. some stories there, absolutely. But Y2K <laughs> sucked me into IT, and I never let go. So thank you. Sounds good. Penelope, what would you tell as the most important skills we need to focus on? Not so much skills, because we can teach skills. And most people can learn any skill if they're given the right training and the right amount of time and instruction in it. But there's a base behavior that needs to be present to really have a vibrant career in technology, so to speak, in my mind. And it's intellectual curiosity. Yeah. The days when I could be a 10-year expert in a single technology, be the smartest person in the room, and couldn't be challenged by anyone, those days are gone. Technology is rotating so fast that expertise is a very fragile thing. And it doesn't get built by forcing it down someone's throat. It gets built because the person has to want to master the technology and has an endless and rapacious desire to learn. And they'll learn whatever new tech you throw their way. If you look at the people that are succeeding in the field of technology today, the one thing they all have in common is just relentless curiosity. Why, 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 why? Nothing is ever good enough. They seek to know more. And so if you look at yourself and the behaviors and you think about how you embrace the world, if that's the way you wake up in the morning, this is the field for you. It's a self-directed kind of learning and exploration journey. And it's just a joy from a career perspective, in my opinion. Thank oh, you. Yeah. Yeah. If I can just add a little bit to that, I love all of that. And, you know, it's, it's, it's true with, you know, we're talking about these skills um, that, you know, when I, they ask, I get asked about, you know, what, what are things that, what advice do you give? And I just love, great advice, Penelope, great advice, Ron. Thank you. That's really helpful for me too. Um, but if I look at what they're saying and the same themes, it's be comfortable being uncomfortable because mm -hmm. technology is constantly changing. Things are constantly evolving. And the pace at which things are constantly evolving is much faster than it has ever been. And so be comfortable being uncomfortable so that you can try new things. The curiosity part I love. The fact that you, you they're always going to be really meaty, challenging problems to solve. And how do you go about doing that? So I think this is like amazing. I, I, I couldn't add any more other than that. Thank you. And so I'm going to end. We have about five minutes with a rapid fire question since we are on this. If what would you, I love how you're talking about you're constantly disrupting yourself, right? Mm -hmm. And so. Jay, I'm going to start with you. What would you tell your younger self? And just like the power of cloud is here to stay, is chat GPT and AI here to stay? So rapid fire. Uh, yes, I would tell tell myself that, um, you know, don't be afraid because things will keep happening. Just don't be afraid. Keep moving on. Uh, that was one big thing that as a younger self, I struggled and challenged with. And is uh, AI here to stay? Yes. Um, variations and forms of AI is here to stay. You said specifically chat GPT, but there's various different variations of AI. And I think it's a very important thing that's going to happen with the amount of data that we have and the things that are needed to help solve um, and leverage that data to make really um, important decisions. Thank you, Jay. Ron? Um, the things from one, I'll tell myself, you belong here. You belong here. This is where you're supposed to be, right? No one's going to take that from you. And the other thing I'll quickly say to myself is, Always bet on yourself. If you're not going to bet on yourself, who's going to bet on you? So always have the confidence that if there's a job description and it says 10 things and you could do seven of them, 
apply for it. I guarantee someone else who has only five of the skills is going to apply for it. So bet on yourself. And uh, are those technologies here that say yes? I think it's just another variation of, like I said earlier, a macro on an AS400. Um, it is essentially here to stay. And the question is, how do we leverage it? And then the last thing I'll say to that is um, the ethical nature of that is kind of where we have to just make sure we get our arms around that part. Because it could do amazing, great things, but it also could do some very detrimental things as well. So we really have to make sure we have a good uh, conscience behind what we're doing. Responsibility. Yeah. And Penelope, closing with you. I would tell my inner self to quit worrying about it and enjoy the ride. The world that you see right now is not going to look anything like itself <laughs> in 10 years. And there's no way you can predict it. So just get in there and ride it. Learn, enjoy, grow, and, and take the challenges as they come every day. Don't worry so much about it because the opportunities are endless. And on the AI front, um, there are things that people can do that AI can never replicate. And there are things that AI can do that people can never replicate. So I believe there will come a place where the two can join up in new and unique ways and solve problems that we as a species alone by ourselves cannot solve. So yes, I think it's here to say, I think we've only begun to tap the power of it. I completely agree with Ron. There's lots of practical things we got to think about to use it right. If you're going to have a weapon, you better darn know how to use it, right? Um, but we have plenty of time to sit back and enjoy the ride of learning how to do all that. And don't have a great beer at the age of 12. That's not fun. Don't have one. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. And I just loved how you inspired not just the heart and the brain, but just in terms of being not afraid and going forward. So with that, I think we are right on time as we come to a close. And again, I hope uh, I learned that I learned a few things and I feel like energized. And I hope the same for the audience. Thank you. Great job, Asha. Thank you. Sasha. Bye. Thank you, everyone, and great job. Thank you, Asha, for leading that panel. Um, I, you were at the end saying, you know, sit back and just do it. And I was saying, I was just sitting back listening throughout that whole panel. So <laughs> that was a, a perfect close there for us. Um, thank you, everyone, for, uh, for being here and being part of that panel today.